welcome to the deep dive. Today our mission is to uh, really cut through the noise around financial technology. Mm -hmm. We're looking at companies trying to pull off what feels like the ultimate high wire act merging blockchain with you know the very rigid world of regulated banking and today we are dissecting metallicus mm -hmm. their vision is frankly pretty compelling yeah. it's right there on their site empowering global access to traditional banking and digital assets right so they aren't trying to burn the banks down from the outside they're building the compliant plumbing for them and what really hooks you i think is the founding team's background it's it's almost a contradiction oh for sure you've got marshall hayner the ceo a real crypto OG. He developed the first ever Bitcoin wallet on Facebook, and he's on the board of the Dogecoin Foundation. And his co-founder, Glenn Marion, created Dogechain.info. I mean, it's the ultimate pivot story, isn't it? It really is. These pioneers from the sort of irreverent, decentralized side of crypto, and they formalized a company vision back in 2016 that is all about institutional compliance. It suggests they saw the writing on the wall pretty early on that without trust, without regulation, this whole thing would never really scale. Exactly. So that's our focus for this deep dive, that compliance first philosophy. How have they actually operationalized it to build what they call the digital banking network or TDBN? And maybe more importantly, how did they convince traditional finance TradFi that blockchain can be a friend, not an enemy? Well, let's start right there with that foundation. Why? For them, does regulation have to be the absolute priority? Yeah, well, what's the core belief? It all comes down to scaling. They believe for digital assets to really become part of everyday life, you need three pillars you just can't compromise on. Okay. Intelligent regulation, preventive security, and verified identity. And that phrase, intelligent regulation, is key. The sources really stress that this means designing systems that proactively stop financial crime not just react to it. Precisely. Their CEO has said that most crypto companies fail because they treat compliance like, you know, a checkbox, something you do at the end. An afterthought. An afterthought, exactly. Instead of weaving it into the actual architecture of the system from day one. Which means you need leaders who understand both of those worlds mm. deeply. And when you look at their executive team, their advisory board, this is where it stops being just another tech project and starts looking like a serious institutional play. It's a very calculated blend. It is. I mean, they didn't just hire lawyers. You've got their CFO, Irina Burkon, who's a Forbes featured exec. Mm. But then you get to Osgur Bekara, head of regulatory compliance. Okay. Over 20 years of experience in anti-money laundering and blockchain. Both. Wow. And the general manager, John Ainsworth, he came from senior roles at MasterCard and Visa. Not to mention he was CEO of Bonify, which is a name we're definitely going to come back to. Right. So these are people who know how global payments actually work. But the real, I think the real aha moment for you, the listener, is when you look at the advisory board. This is pure credibility bait. It's designed to open doors. The most cautious doors in finance. They got Mark Carawan. Who was the former chief compliance officer for Citigroup? For Citigroup, yeah. Wait, a former CCO from a bank like Citi? That means he knows exactly what regulators worry about, what the internal pressures are. It changes the whole conversation, doesn't it? Oh, completely. And you also have Sergio Rodriguez Jr., who consulted on AI for the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and Mark F. Joseph, former managing counsel at BNY Mellon. So when you walk into a meeting with a bank's board, you're not just pitching an idea from some crypto startup. No. You're presenting a solution that's been validated by their former peers. That immediately calms the biggest fear, which is systemic risk. And they backed it up with process, too. They got the SOC2 certification. Mm -hmm. For anyone in finance, what signal does that send? It's a massive signal. It just screams trustworthiness. It's an independent audit that verifies your controls, your policies on security, on privacy, on availability. So it proves you're not just running some wild experiment. Right. It shows you're operating a professional tech service that meets the benchmarks for handling very sensitive financial data. Okay, so... They've built the trust. They've got the right people, the right audits. Now, how do you turn that into market share? Well, their next move wasn't to go after the giant global banks. No. It was to secure the foundation of the U.S. financial system, credit unions. And that's where Bonafi comes back in. Exactly. Huh. Their acquisition of Bonafi in late 2024 was honestly strategically brilliant. Bonafi used to be C-Ledger, a credit union service organization. So that one move just plug them directly into an existing network. Instantly. 
It brought over 70 credit unions into their ecosystem and, maybe more importantly, decades of established trust within that community. Which now gives them network access to something like 750 financial institutions, right? Yeah. Through things like the Cornerstone Lead Partnership. They essentially bought their way into the club. So how do they actually onboard these institutions who are famously cautious? Through something called the Banking Innovation Program. You can think of it like a confidential sandbox. Oh. It's an open invitation. They say, come explore blockchain with us. Digital identity, asset tokenization, private subnets, all at no cost with our engineers guiding you. It's high-level R&D for institutions that just can't afford to take high risks. It de-risks that whole exploration phase. And we already have a really powerful live example of this working. The St. Cloud Financial Credit Union Partnership. That's the one. Them, along with Delan CUSO, they use this exact framework to launch the Cloud Dollar, or CLDUSD. Which is being cited as the very first credit union-issued stablecoin in the U.S. It's a huge milestone. It proves a regulated local financial institution can issue its own digital asset backed by its own reserves on this compliant infrastructure. This isn't just a press release. It's tangible proof that the bridge they're building actually works. And once an institution gets past that successful experiment, they graduate to the TDBN, the Digital Banking Network. So what is TDBN? How should we think about that? TDBN is the destination. It's the secure operational ecosystem. But it's not just a platform. It's a appliance wrapper, meaning everything built inside it has to adhere to standards like the Bank Secrecy Act, KYCML, and this is critical ISO 2022. Can you pause there for a second? ISO 2022. It's an acronym people see, but why is it so vital here? Because it's the future language of global finance. Yeah. It standardizes how financial messages are structured. Yeah. So instead of a message just saying A paid B $100, it allows for incredibly rich structured data, the kind you need for regulatory reporting, for auditing, and for talking to legacy systems like SWIFT. So if you want to connect to the big pipes of TradFi, you have to speak their language. You have to speak ISO 2022. All right, let's get into the tech that's powering all this. It's not just one simple chain. It's a whole stack. Right. Let's start at the very bottom, the foundation. That's the metal blockchain, ticker metal. This is a layer zero platform. Layer zero. So simply put, that's not where the apps live. It's the engine room. It's the engine room, exactly. It provides the security for other specialized networks to launch on top of it. And they chose the Snow Consensus Protocol, which is similar to Avalanche. Mm. Why that specific choice for a regulated network? Speed and finality. Snow is all about near instant transaction finality. We're talking something like 4,500 transactions per second per subnet with settlement in about half a second. Wow. For a bank doing a high value transfer, knowing for a fact that your transaction is done and irreversible in under a second, that's non-negotiable. And other protocols can have much longer wait times. Much longer. Unacceptable for institutional finance. So Metal Blockchain is the engine, and it lets these institutions launch their own private, customized networks. They're subnets. They're called sovereign subnets, and this is really the genius of the architecture. Think of them as private blockchains tailored for one institution or group. But they can still talk to each other. Yes, they're interoperable. But each subnet can enforce its own specific compliance rules. A German bank could enforce EU rules on its subnet, while a U.S. credit union enforces U.S. rules on theirs. That's the unlock, isn't it? <sighs> Customizable compliance. That's it. It keeps the spirit of a permissionless network, but enables the localized permission control that regulators demand. Okay, so moving up the sack, you have the XPR network, the layer one that used to be Proton Chain. If metal is for the banks, who is XPR for? XPR is for the user. It's the retail-facing layer one. This is where the user experience comes in. It's built for speed, for finance, and crucially... The fees. Zero network fees for standard transactions. If you want my glamour to use this stuff, you can't be talking about gas fees and failed transactions. And the human-readable names help a lot. The at name system. You're not sending money to a 40-character string of nonsense. Yeah. You're paying at Jane Smith. Right. And it all plugs into their identity system, WebAuth. Which uses Passcase. Yeah, it uses the web authentication standard, leveraging your device's secure hardware. This kills the need for browser plugins, which are a huge security risk, and makes it much harder to fall for phishing attacks. It's basically bringing the security we're used to from Apple and Google into crypto. Okay, let's talk about the products on top of all this. The decentralized exchange, Metal X. So Metal X runs on that speedy XPR network. It's got token swaps, liquidity pools, loans, the usual DX stuff. But the key thing, especially for a bank, is the self-custody. 
The funds never leave the user's wallet. Never. It's all managed by smart contracts. That yeah. means zero counterparty risk. No need for a centralized company to give you proof of reserves. And what about their stable coin, the metal dollar or sex MD? That's a different approach. It's a risk mitigation strategy. It's not pegged to dollars sitting in one bank account. It's a basket-based stablecoin. It's backed by other existing proven stablecoins. Yeah. Right now, that includes USDC, PayPal's PYUSD, and USDP. The idea is to diversify away from the risk of any single issuer failing. And who decides what's in that basket? That's governed by the metal DAO. The holders of the SexMT token vote on it. It decentralizes the decision-making around what makes the stablecoin stable. This brings us to a huge philosophical question. If you are building for TradFi, you have to address risk. And Marshall Hayner has suggested that the TDBN, this consortium of banks, could have the power to reverse hacks or catastrophic losses. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Doesn't that just, doesn't that completely undermine the whole idea of an immutable blockchain? That is the trade-off. And it's the conversation everyone in this reg tech phase of DeFi has to have. Because for a crypto purist, Reversibility is a sin. It's anathema, absolutely. Yeah. But for a credit union's board of directors, the ability for a governing body to step in and reverse a clear, verifiable smart contract exploit, that's not a bug. It's the trust mechanism they need. It's like deposit insurance. So they're selling a hybrid, the speed and transparency of blockchain, but with a safety net, with human governance. Exactly. It's a system built to win the trust of billions of regulated dollars that would otherwise never, ever touch a blockchain. It solves the I lost my keys, I lost my life savings problem. Looking forward to 2025, their roadmap seems to point towards even broader expansion specifically into the Ethereum ecosystem. Yeah, the plan to put Metal X on Metal L2, that's an Ethereum scaling solution using optimistic rollups, that's a huge move. Why? It gives them access to all the liquidity, all the developers on Ethereum, while still maintaining their compliance standards through that rollup mechanism. Plus, they're building in AI tools like an AI-assisted DX to make trading simpler. So let's bring it all home. What does this entire deep dive mean for you, the listener? I mean, Metallicus is trying to solve the biggest point of friction in finance. The end game here is a totally different user experience. Simple, instant, global payments. Marshall Hanner's analogy was paying at Sabrina Fati, not typing in routing numbers and waiting three days. It's the infrastructure for the internet of value. And like you said, we're now in the reg tech phase of decentralized finance. He predicts that only the crypto companies that lean into this, that build these bridges, are the ones that will actually survive and scale. Which leaves us with a final provocative thought for you to chew on. If regulatory alignment really is the key, the biggest unlock for digital assets, mm -hmm. How quickly will institutional adoption of this kind of compliant blockchain infrastructure just completely overshadow retail crypto and fundamentally change who controls the world's primary wealth rails? Because this infrastructure is absolutely purpose-built for those giants. And their movement will define the next decade. I'd really encourage you to look into this idea of sovereign subnets, understanding how institutions can have customized compliance on their own private networks while still being globally connected. That's the key. Controlled yet connected. That's how you can see where the future of finance is really headed.